Hey guys, welcome to TGS and we're at Hoax today and we're going to be looking at their collection of auction stuff for September 2020 main auction. I'm going to start with this pair of William & Sons 20 balls, which are actually quite subtle and discreet when you look over the outside, a beautiful piece of wood, very nice engraving, and you flick it over and you have a couple of pinups on the bottom. And I expect there's more polite, more appropriate word for them. But what a way to open up with a couple of beautiful London built guns with best quality ladies on the bottom. I think these are absolutely beautiful pair of guns. The ladies do not match, but the rest of the guns do. I think they're lovely. Best London guns. Let's put these away and get a look around the room. So straight from the top and down to something less exciting, but it's still beautiful. It's an AYA number two. Very simple, very plain, but great solid guns nonetheless. I've always been a big fan of AYAs for being solid, if nothing else. It does seem harsh in the modern world that they, well, with all cyber size taking a dip, these guys have actually held fair value. But what that does mean is they're now, you know, you can pick up, have a look, there's a Stephen Grant over there that's valued at not more than one of these is by too much. It's not the best of order, but would you rather a, actually it's not a fair question, is it? Would you rather a tired Stephen Grant or a really solid AYA? As a user, obviously they are AYA actually, so it's not that easy as to say one or the other. There is a significant amount of purdies in this sale, all in beautiful little motor cases. I think you'll go there. Oh, that's particularly stunning actually, that really is beautiful. And another one down there. Tell you what, they're a pair. <laughs> that's really lovely, that really is lovely. Oh, this is exciting. This is actually rather exciting indeed. There you go, have a look at this. A Beasley. Is that not one of the finest looking things you've seen today? That's beautiful, just those fences there, if nothing else, are a fine looking thing. That's a proper statement piece. The fact the gun inside's made really well as well is just a bonus. It's just the bonus. Now this is um, something you won't forget in a hurry. Actually, this is quite uh, different. Firstly, the case is a little bit too big for the gun. Um, so you've got these sticks made up to go through the barrels to hold it in place, which is interesting. But what is interesting about this William Ford, which is a really fine looking gun, is if you clock it, you'll notice those locks look like Salvador Dali's got a hold of them. And they are all designed to give this gun a huge amount of drop. So now if you look at it in profile, you'll know, you can see how much this entire thing curves down. And watch the point, it looks like a swan's neck. It looks like you've got almost an inverted cone, but you don't, it just appears that way. However, once you mount it up, you notice I'm looking straight into the back of the safety catch. I'm not just saying, looking straight there, actually. Um, I presume it is designed for somebody to shoot who doesn't like holding a gun normally or has something different about their body. But why have something conventional? Why keep the lock straight? Be different, be awkward. Why not? And actually you end up with something quite unique. However, if eyeing up this beautiful, beautiful gun, just beware that short of you being a bit different looking, you might not fit that well. From the best of the Purdies to this clock this when we had a little look around earlier that it is an odd one not in action or design but in stock the stock is extremely short like extremely short and you've had this fitted which is odd anyway not for me peter colborn of stratford on avon he is a maker I have not, he is a maker I am not particularly au fait with. So the action's really, really nicely put together. As are the barrels, the part they make is perhaps less than desirable. And you know, it locks up and it handles very nicely, a beautiful little 20 ball side by side. However, I feel it's let down ever so slightly in the stocking department. 
I am not an expert, well, not particularly, but uh, the rest of this is beautiful and then the stock is just not wildly exciting and it's a stock that will last, it's not overly exotic, so it's not like looking for fragility, but all the effort to build a gun, relatively modern in the grand scheme of England, is sad that when people don't feel the need to splash a couple hundred extra quid on a blank. And the drop points are perhaps less refined than perhaps they could be. But the rest of it is stunning. Absolutely stunning. Especially if you like a good deep dark colour hardening. Come have a little look at this. This is a Joseph Lang hammer gun. And we have the cream of all hammer guns in the world just here. A boss, a purdy, another boss. And this Lang actually really genuinely stands out. But the work around the fences, everything about this gun is sleek and low profile and generally rather wonderful, I think. But hey, so is that. Look at that. Look at that top strap. Isn't that beautiful? Absolutely beautiful. I really like that. You want to see some exciting browning? There's the barrels that go with that, boss. That's very pretty as well. 73 St. James Street. That is a beautiful piece of Damascus. So's this. Look at that. Look at that beauty around there. With, interestingly, this is a really nice part about this, is got cocking indicators or, or loaded indicators. So, non rebounding action. So, just cock those back. Look at the beautiful engraving work on these hammers. There is a reason they got, they're the best. But once you put a cartridge in the chamber, these just push back. And if they're up, the gun is loaded. A really nice and easy way to tell whether the gun is loaded or not, and hence you can put your hammers down without making it go bang. Clever, eh? Really smart, really beautiful piece of kit. Checkering is coarse, but that's by the by. Actually, what I really like is that solid trigger guard. It's a nice slightly different feature. I like that. I'm not sure why. Okay. Which brings us on to my favourite gun of the entire auction. That is a lie, but it is nice. It's not that nice either. So this is a Hellis. He has been restocked. Not in Walnut. Um, yeah, I mean, what more do you say about that, eh? It is unique, for sure, and somebody out there will love it. Like an ugly child. And if you want something that's different, unique, given this gun probably was never that pretty in the first place, it is certainly unique. Two inch cases, I mean, they weren't devaluing it, were they? A two inch 12 bore Hellis in a stock and four end combination that is pretty in its own right. But look at the checkering. I mean, so this has been painted, this has been boarded out and then someone has painstakingly used a star punch across the entire thing. Yeah. It is a work of art, it's well made. I mean, it's not horrible either. The whole thing is, I don't know. Different sometimes isn't bad, uh, and I quite like it. So this one is particularly beautiful, based, if nothing else, around the engraving. So on one side you've got a beautiful cover of grey partridge, and it's this stark contrast between the, the plainness and the beauty of this fine bellino and the rather loud acanthus does appeal. The woodcock going through the Silver Birches is equally as stunning. A little pheasant on the trigger guard. Acanthus class fences, same just down the breaches there. It is a beautiful little Asprey of New Bond Street, 28 bore. And the thing on the whole is actually really very delightful. Next. And then for some reason, a weblin has got one, for one 1020, which are great guns. I don't feel like it belongs quite in, well, do they belong in this room? It's, there's worse. And it's nice and it's new, so I'll leave it alone, actually. Sticking with the modern and classic stuff, here is a 725 grade 5 20 bore. 
I'm not sure we've actually ever reviewed one of these, but it is a beauty. And in the 20 bore, it's actually quite nice. I mean, the wood on this one probably leaves a little to be desired, but it's not ugly and it is actually a very smart and sophisticated beast 32 inch 20 bore. Like this is a 32 inch beast MX8, which is perhaps a little bit nicer. A step up trap rib, big heavy monster of a gun with probably five eighths and five eighths, five eighths and a half choke. That's really nice. That is really nice cased. For those who like MX8s, that is a good one. See, this here Williamson is very stylish indeed, just in the way that the engraving runs between everything. The 409, roses, the breech, the rib, beautiful roses, and the action. And I wouldn't say that it's done with any subtlety whatsoever, but I don't think that's why you would like a gun of this particular style. And they are done exceptionally. It is absolutely beautiful, serial number 12. But my favorite thing of it all is the top lever. I think it's probably not, instead of having standard checkering, what you have is a, a rose on each side. And that in itself is just a thing of beauty. Absolute thing of beauty. Oh, that's lovely. Just the way that barrel clips into the top there. So very, very pleasant and reassuring about that. Merkel, so you've got an eagle chasing some ducks and you've got a fox chasing some pheasants. I mean, I don't know if there are any keepers looking at this gun, that's for sure. Continuing the theme of guns that are absolutely stunningly engraved, this is an Abbey Attico and Salvinelli Pegasus. I think, like all Abbey Atticos, it's stunning isn't it? Bit of a small ball theme, really. That's beautiful. Shame about the wood, really. But apart from that, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. A Fausty Class SL. Reserve right to stay silent on that one. We've already looked at that Abbey Attico. We haven't looked at this Midland, though. This is very interesting, Midland. So this is interesting by proxy of the fact it's a single shot side lock that's interesting and the fact that the engraving is seemingly acid etched on i think i don't really know um it doesn't look like it's original that's for sure virtue of it overrunning some of the hand engraving and not looking particularly in place and not that it's badly done but it's interesting so i don't know about you but there's always something very special about any bar in wood guns some of them are less fancy, like this one, but it is still absolutely gorgeous. It's a little purdy. You can see the carving around the fences is very delicious and deep. And the lines where it's got the push under snap lever, or push down under lever, it is beautiful as a thing. Just that floating island of metal, I don't know. I don't know about you, I just think it's beautiful. I have another one. I have another one. Holtz has another one. This is a barring wood hammer gun instead, so a little bit less sleek than its brother here. A little bit less sleek, but nonetheless beautiful. It is Damascus, original barrels, and we're just chatting about it. It does have enough life in the barrels to actually be worth a restoration because there's not much left in terms of original checkering or anything on there. What's also interesting about this is not so much the hammers. Hammers are normal. The thumb hole, push down, under lever. A, um, a brief dance with something that was is a bit odd, but nevertheless, a beautiful thing, bar and wood with a very interesting system. I personally feel in terms of usability, the ability to just push that down and, and load is uh, quite pleasant by comparison to having to faff. However, I'm sure it's one of those things you'd probably get used to if you wanted something a bit different but I feel like it's also the sort of gun you'd buy just to be contrarian. That would sum up most of the people I know, to be fair, so that's no bad thing. Uh, this is a Section 1 12-bore, 
which is just a rolling block. These are exceptionally cool and never go for huge money. And if I needed a section one shotgun, I think I'd have one. I don't really know why, but it is really nice. Great color, really good condition. For what it is at least. What a beauty. I like that a lot. So this is one of two mantons that we're gonna do now. This one is a little 20 ball side lock ejector. It is very finely made, very nicely put together. In fact, I really struggled to pick any holes in this whatsoever. It's a beautiful, beautiful gun. The only thing that I dislike on the whole thing is the lettering on top. And that's just me being picky. And it was probably a stylistic choice over anything else. But the engraving, the woodwork, the action work, it is a good looking best gun. Which kind of means it blends in with a lot of the other guns here, which is a good thing. What doesn't blend in is his big brother. Out of all the guns I've picked up in this room, this one probably brings the biggest smile to my face in terms of a proper, true, classy, three-barreled British gun that you could own for less than 10 grand. That appeals massively. And the fact that it looks really good. I like that. And I could do with three shots quite regularly. I like that a lot. So next we've got something that is probably of extreme interest and great history. And for those who like research will be a gun you'd be really interested in. However, it is of fairly low value, so my apologies. This gun here is a William Powell uh, standard snap lever. It is a push forward under lever snap action. We've seen them before. Interesting, no safety. Not uncommon back then with uh, live pigeon shooting being what it was is that there was no safety catches involved because, well, one didn't want to not have a gun that worked or goes bang by accident. We know what safety catches are like. However, this one gets interesting when we look at the locks here that say William A. Adams, Safety Locks, July 1884. And this is where the guys here at Holtz got very interested in it because it wasn't just a standard common or garden William Powell. So W. Adams bought this on the 2nd September 1880. Interestingly, W. Adams, with his safety locks, didn't. there was no actually patent registered for those. However, there were certain patents registered. In fact, William Adams was a gun maker. So the supposition is, or the guess is with this gun, that it was bought after William Adams had registered a patent earlier in 1879 for his own patent underlever, bought this gun because the spiral spring action in these, meaning there's actually a, a spring behind here, a coil spring as opposed to a leaf spring, bought this gun to become inspired by its internals before registering his own spiral spring design in 1883. There you go. That is mildly interesting. I say mildly interesting. The safety bolt design he did register, again, interestingly, after the safety locks here, were in 1889, 1880, 1895, sorry, with Robertson, Robertson being Robertson of Boss. So this gun is an entire mystery. I did ask the guys whether here if they'd opened it up, but they say, that could be a mistake, seeing as nobody knows what is on the inside. This is very likely a complete one-off with some magic work by William A. Adams done to the inside. So there you go. That in itself is an extremely exciting gun that you could have a complete one-off. It is an entire mystery. And entire mysteries are very exciting, I think. Possibly. All of that aside, it is actually quite a beautiful, extremely sleek looking gun. Talking of sleek looking guns. How's this? A Thomas Bizzle. Isn't this rather delightful? External hammers, internal strikers, rotary underlever. Isn't that a really sleek and beautiful thing? Yes, is the answer. So here we've got something rather delicious. William Powell come Stephen Grant magic combo. It's a Stephen Grant action, William Powell barrels, side lever, non-ejector. This is gorgeous. 
absolutely gorgeous. You will go a long time and never see a gun that looks this good. Yeah, it's got some issues. So someone's tried rejointing it at some point and done a fairly average job. And the fact they've rejointed and it still has a headache and then still has some stock work that needs doing somewhere along the line because it's still a little bit wobbly is uh, sad. However, it is extremely rescuable. The barrels are at least very good or good. Look at that, it's just, Stephen Grant guns really are beautiful. And those side levers, look at the lines of it. So this gun, I think is 800 to 1200 quid estimate. So if you bought this, had it rejointed, had it rebrowned, did something with the stock. Let's say that cost you a grand. You were in for about two and a half thousand pounds. I would struggle to find, and this would look mint for that sort of money. For two and a half thousand pounds, a gun that would look more classy and still be very relatively desirable given that it's a non-ejector. I quite like it. I quite like it. Would I buy it and put my own money into it? Well, I was about to say no, but then you just look at that. Look how beautiful this gun is. Like, I think if you saw it and you were here on sale day, you probably wouldn't be able to resist putting a cheeky-ish bid on it, seeing as most of the bids on it, the value is cheeky. The value of the damn thing is cheeky, so it's hard maybe to not. Cogswell and Harrison Optimums, Italian-made coggies, but they are still a damn good-looking gun for what they are. But another Stephen Grant, that's gorgeous as well. That is lovely. Bernadelli. These are probably more affordable. A Gunmark Marlin by V. Bernadelli. That's a stylistic pheasant. An E.J. Churchill. Over and under. 20 ball. A lot of 20 balls in this auction. A lot of very nice 20 balls in this auction. Look at that. What a stunning, stunning machine that is. Next up in the realms of extremely interesting guns, this is a Holland. This one is also a single trigger. This one becomes very interesting when we talk about the ability to push the trigger forward. And that's an extremely light touch on the back of the trigger there that actually makes it fire the left barrel first. And you can reset that by just pushing the top lever over. That in itself is extremely cool, game scene aside. Something about that refinement of just having to touch it to make it go. I like it. Which brings me on to one of my favorite things. This is a 358 Winchester. So inherently is, um, yes, requiring a larger magazine like this. This is an interesting gun. So, you put your magazine in, which is really not intuitive in the slightest. Now you have to push the button to put the mag in. And you have, all of a sudden, a straight pull, bull pup rifle with Picatinny rails on. You have grip safety, but also allows you to do this. To say that it's pretty average looking is an understatement, and yet I still love it. This is a good looking rifle with some interesting features. A bit like some of the other things, look, you wouldn't want to take one to your gunsmith if it was broken, but one would hope that it wouldn't do that. Look at that. I didn't even see that. Your port opens. Look at all the, you've got the exposed trigger up the front. That is cool. Super short barrel, screw cut with a mod fitted. I was about to say it hasn't done a lot, but I can't imagine anyone who owns this rifle doing it. Hey, I was there. This is not the sort of rifle you're gonna buy if you're gonna do an awful lot of shooting, I wouldn't have thought. Especially not in 358 Win Mag, but it is damn cool. Um, I presume under this rail is probably a, another rail to mount, mount stuff on, but yeah. The little Sommer. That 
is um yeah i wish it was still in 243 to be honest i do wish it was still in 243. And this is where we get into the really cool stuff i say well, obviously we've already been there but look at this this is a monster let's put it together and here we have a wesley richard double eight non ejector monster this is probably the biggest gun in this room and it's not it's not unwieldy by comparison to some modern 12 bore and unders it's actually all right There is slight issues in that the barrels have slight bulges, but apart from that, what a beautiful looking gun. And I mean, I wouldn't say it's particularly sleek, but I don't think you're buying a double eight to be sleek. It is intentionally robust and mean looking. How cool. So this is one of two vaguely interesting, more modern rifles that are in this auction. It is a Remy 700 with a custom bolt in an Accurate International chassis, because it makes it actually a real Accurate International. Where this gets very interesting, more than anything, is this, a full-length shrouded silencer that does make it look very cool. But the engineering on this is actually very cool. All sarcasm aside, it is a 308. You have a probably 16 or 18 inch barrel, 18 inch by the look of it, with a 18 inch moderator that is reflexed back over the barrel. I think personally, that's pretty cool. I am very easily pleased, obviously, but in terms of engineering, the rest of it, I'm not how fussed about. But the full length moderator, the effort it must have taken to put that moderator on there over and above just making one to go on a screw thread. This barrel has been custom made with this. Here is something going from the rather large to the rather small and delightful. This is a Fausti DEA that I might be able to get together at some point too soon. There we go, just to keep those ejectors out. This is a 28 bore side by side by Fausti. There's a lot about this gun that I quite like. Mostly the Magnum end on a 28 bore actually is quite nice. It is too small and whippy and perfect if you want that kind of thing. A little Fausty DEA, very pleasant. In its own little way. I'd say as a full grown man, you might struggle to shoot it, but oh, God, that's actually quite a nice touch. Though it's a shame that they've put it on the pad and not onto the stock directly, but you can't have everything. These are not overly expensive guns. And it is hand engraved. That's a really nice touch actually. I quite like that. You can keep that on your wall when you have it extended to an adult length. I like that, surprisingly. This is a Holland and Holland semi-automatic. They only ever made one. It's a lie. It's a Benelli M2. So these two are probably a little bit more in my price bracket, depressingly. Um, this is a Webley and Scott, and this is a Jensen. They are both very, very similar. I think they were brought in must be 10 years ago, 11 years ago as a very affordable side lock over and under shotgun. And they were actually quite expensive. I think they were like three and a half, four, four and a half grand. They were not cheap side lock shotguns, or well, they were not cheap guns, but for Turkish guns at the time, they were rather expensive. They did a silver one, marketed Jensen. They did this in black as well, black chrome. And they did this, which is a case color hardened dish looking Webley and Scott. Same engraving, different names, and different stock specs. So the Jensen was more of a, well certainly this one is, and I believe they all were, more of a heavyweight beaver tail forend, higher comb, very distinct right hand palm swells, big cutaways. And I'm sure Simon will bore, you know, I, his eyes in the back of my head for saying, that actually it's not horrific. It's not horrific. Given you could own this side lock shotgun for less than a grand, that's pretty good. That is pretty good today. So people's folly for buying them back then, which was for large money, which I think they really did struggle to sell them to be fair. And remember, they ended up, the importers ended up getting rid of them with some speed um, for not a lot of money because I think they realized that at the time people weren't ready to be spending that sort of money in the Turkish market. There was still a lot of deriding that went on towards Turkish guns because people still thought they were junk. 
And um, yeah, and that was the short life of these. Both of these are pretty much new by the look of it. Um, or pretty much unused. Either way, they're actually not bad. This Webley and Scott is probably less good. Its spec is more gamey and as such, less appealing than the big heavyweight Sidelock Jensen. Although I think in the silver, it gives away its quality a little bit more than it does in the color taste color harder than tradition. But on a positive note, there is no positive note, but you could own a Sidelock over and under. Just don't tell people what it's called and they'll think of its great. And you can go and play with the SO boys. This is a Luciano Bosis. Have a look at this 417 Nitro Express double. It's really very pretty. From the back, you have what could be described as a very practical pad. It is not that nice, but it will be extremely practical. And given that it's a 470 Nitro Express, uh, recoil reduction is paramount. Oval, raised cheek piece, beautiful trigger guard, skeleton bit there. Which looks like somebody's played with, which is a shame. Buff in the grass, big buff in the grass. Brescia, Italy, Luciano Bosis. The engraving on this is absolutely beautiful. Everything about it is sleek and stylish. Yeah, I've, I've texted that. And then sorry. you have beautiful arcaded fences, which is beautiful. And the pierced top lever in the shape of a dog sniffing the ground. That may not be a dog sniffing the ground, but in my head, it's like, you know when your dog's like got his snout in the ground? That's a lizard or a dragon. It's most definitely a dog. You reckon it's a dog? It's probably a lizard, but it's a dog. Okay. Might it be a lizard? Can it be a dog sniffing the ground? You know, like, when you've got that dog like sniffing the ground, looking for the buff who just shot. Why would it be a lizard? Right, let me get a proper close up of this. It, oh, see, it's got the head of a fish, the claws of a dragon, and the tail of a horse. Let's call it the Sasha Beast. Yeah. I like the fact that it could be a dog. Although it's probably the Sasha Beast. Okay. Thanks for ruining my dreams. Anyway, this is a very interesting sum of its parts, this gun. Um, from the beautiful fences, to the Sasha Beast, to the Dagger Boy, to the everything about it, in fact. To the gigantic caliber. I like that a lot. Although, I'm not sure if it's the fish. Definitely a fish's head. With a dog's body. And giant claws. Thanks for ruining that for me, Sash. So this is quite an interesting one. This is a Abiatico, and it is beautiful. Got a heffalump, and a buff, and obviously it's nicely engraved. And it comes with a 12 ball set and a 375 set of barrels, which is quite interesting. From the Sublime rifles to something a little bit more realistic, you've got a very interesting setup here of a single shot. It says. with a very interesting set of barrels. Single set, double set triggers. And he says, a very interesting falling block system with the trigger built into it. One of those beautiful and unnecessary guns. But the action of the metalwork is really, really stunning. Actually, if you like carved stuff at least. I'm not a huge fan of, but it is extremely well done, actually. Extremely well done, especially this little bit here. This is a Bretter SO4. Isn't it pretty? See, I almost just put this away, and then I put it on the floor, and realized how tall it was, which made me then pick it back up and have a proper look at it. This SO4 has 36 inch barrels. It is being sleeved, so, you know, the, the, the thought is that perhaps the barrels were damaged or something like that. But it's a proper sleeving job. The roof's been quarter cut, everything like that, and it looks very well done. And it feels even better. 36 inch barrels. 36 inch barrels. That don't feel bad, that feel like a heavyish 32. They feel good. Like it is a monster. I mean, I don't know if I can quite get this into perspective, but this is a proper gun. This is what short people feel like when they pick up 32s. Now I kind of get it. I mean, the way the rib's been set up and the bead and such, it's 
well, a bit different, but it's lovely. Six to nine grand, is it worth it? Well, the big question is, is where the hell are you gonna find a 36 inch barreled gun without asking for one to be made or having one sleeved yourself, which is gonna cost probably the best part of that by the time you bought or found a scrap gun. I tell you what, I kind of actually really like that. If anyone wants to buy me a nice Christmas present, birthday present, present, or just let me shoot it if you buy it, all season, that'd be great. It doesn't even fit in the rack. <laughs> this is a sleeper Rigby in 275 Rigby. As you can see, Waffen Fabric Mauser 1910 on the top. And this one is, they say they didn't open the box for 15 years. A little crack there, that's a bit of a shame. But apart from that, this is very, very nice. And only a few hours of titivating to getting it back in an exceptional condition because that metal work is really very, very nice indeed. Let's have a look at that bore quickly. So I know it's not particularly exciting. In fact, it is utterly plain. Given that this was made at a time, there was a lot of corrosive junk still inside of cartridges. And more importantly, there's pretty much zero stainless properties inside of the steel. Finding something that tidy is very nice. You have got a very simple uh, unique mounting system on the side here, so you'd have to find out what mounts that was built for, but this was done probably back in the period. It's not a modern, nasty looking thing that's been bolted to the top. This is a classic Rigby Mauser. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Including the case, which by the way is equally as exciting to me, probably more so. However, probably for a fraction of the price, and because I love them, um, and only came across one very recently, as members will know. Have a look at this, which is almost identical to the one I was looking at. An Army and Navy Cooperative Society Limited, London. BSA Lee Speed, probably BSA. Yeah, BSA Lee Speed. Sporter. This is really very, very nice for Cordai only. Having shot one of these now, they are so unbelievably sweet. What you do have around the side there is a gold wire which is really nice and this is also missing the little mag retention piece which is a shame but what a beautiful gun these really are like I'm a huge fan for a classic stalking rifle but to be fair these are also in very good order ball wise I like that a lot I do like that a lot from the wobbly bolt head. Next up, something French. And being French, obviously, it's got to have an odd way of locking up. Uh, not entirely odd, but not entirely normal either. Which is quite an interesting thing, that. Just that little sliding bolt on top, locking in place. And, of course, being French. <laughs> Destined to break. Look at that. How awfully complicated, and yet secretly appealing in its complexness. And you've got the full rotating base there that's on a spring that then hooks into this, which I presume is, yeah, what well, cocks up. That's fascinatingly overly complicated. Well, if you're into having overly complicated things, you add that to the list of stuff you should look at. That's mildly fascinating in complexity. Well, they can't just do everything like everyone else, I don't know. We've seen them before. We've even reviewed one. This is a DT-11L. Very pretty guns. And it's Big Brother. That's nice, isn't it? Number 253 of 300. ASC LX. That's gorgeous. That's very, very nice and seemingly unfired as well. That's beautiful. That really is beautiful. If you want something hard and machine made that is inherently going to be a good thing anyway. Next we've got a couple of military rifles that are both interesting in their own little ways. This one, because it's a M98 Mauser, the scope with nice bits of leather, probably aren't original but are. But the interesting thing about this, if you come have a closer look, is that it is fitted with the winter trigger. So that when you're there in Russia trying to, you know, win a losing battle, you've got 
a very simple, very nice trigger to pull. And actually, depressingly, probably increases the quality of the trigger anyway. Extended safety. This is a very nice piece of kit. A very nice piece of kit indeed. Got a lot of time for that, that's lovely. Now, here we're into the weird and wonderful world of Holloway and Norton, a company that's gone quite quiet recently, but is still active and still making guns. This is a little defendy port over and under, and it is inherently very, very pleasant for a number of reasons, but one more chiefly than others. Firstly, the engraving is not the main reason, but the engraving is very nice. Quite loud, very full, but very, very nice. But the thing about this gun that is particularly nice is this. Instead of having an external push button for end release, you have a built-in sleek little button. Very discreet. I actually quite like the gold on this for a change. You push that button in, and it pops off like that. And you have a very simple, beautiful gun. Everything about it, the double fold on the fences, is very well put together, and that piece of wood is stunning. That's a really very nice thing, indeed. And, oh, yes, you be best not like, even pick these up and put them together. It's safer, uh, or less depressing for the mind to not be wielding guns that are your dreams, I suppose, is a thing. But, and here's the thing, and this is where I'm going to get in a little bit of trouble, I suppose. If we look at its 12 ball brother, if we look at its 12 ball brother, in terms of action profile, you notice behind the fence here, there's these really large protruding segments that actually ends up for a larger, clunkier looking action. It's very strong and it's very good, and there's nothing wrong with it inherently, and there's, all, there's a lot of issues with trying to build a over and under side lock regardless. I mean, if we now go back to, I can't believe I'm doing this, comparing it to this beast. Actually, getting this fitted up on the barrels nicely has forfeited a certain amount of angle. However, now I've shown you this, which comparison to the 20 bore is less stylish. Let me show you this. And I'm sorry to the makers because these are still exceptional guns. But there's just another reason to buy a small gauge when buying an over and under, certainly for an English maker, is if you look at the difference between these two and then you look at the gift of seeing these two. There's something about that style, that flaring at the back there on both of these that I just don't like a lot. I think I like the Mackay Brown more than I do the Holloway and Norton in terms of style and design. I don't know if it's easy or hard to see, but I just feel, I don't know. Who knows? I'm probably the wrong person to talk to about style. I mean, look at me, but I don't know. Let me show you something that I think is truly beautiful. And then, I don't know. I mean, to be fair, this 20 ball is truly beautiful. Just hold it up against it. There's something about these fences and the size of it on the 12 ball that just doesn't tickle me or tickle my fancy. However, saw that, look at the lock plates on this. Or oh, look at the plates on this. Isn't it beautiful? You got the buff with the egret sat on it. All the mallard flying in. It's a good looking gun. Yeah, there's no doubt that this is a good looking gun at all. It's a very fine looking gun. And the Mackay Brown, equally so, is an absolutely stunning looking gun. Absolutely stunning looking gun. However, hold on. Here is a gun by the same maker that I just would say is incomparable. Is this not one of the most beautiful, sleek looking things out there? The answer is obviously yes. It really is beautiful and sleek and well put together and gorgeous and just by comparison is, I mean, it is an over and under versus side by side, so it's not entirely fair as a comparison. But this is beautiful. This is still beautiful, but this is the most beautiful of the two. There you go. That's the easiest way of putting it. They're both good looking, but they are incomparable. If you pull this one out of the slip, you will go weak at the knees. If you pull this one out of the slip, you go, this is a good machine, it's well made and it's pretty. They, I'm just gonna shut up, it's probably wiser, isn't it? A Boer Mauser. A commemorative Boer Mauser. This is quite smart. A pair of guns with the strongest barrel in the world. 
quite nice. Plain ones, but very nice. We've already looked at these, but it's always worth a second look, aren't they beautiful? Mackay Brown 20 balls. Which brings us on to our final guns. It's a matched pair of guns. These are William Powell's. Side locks, cased, that are probably very reasonably priced for the following reasons. They're sleeved, they have very large stock extensions, and yet the stocks are probably only 15 and a quarter, something like that, so not that long for a very long stock extension, but they are a very good looking pair of guns. Three to five grand for a pair. Is that good value? Quite possibly. As Simon's just pointed out, you could quite possibly be onto a winner. Sleeved guns being harder and steel shot being a thing, could this be a better long-term prospect than one of the really minty original pairs? Well, who knows? <laughs> That's very much up to you, but if you could buy these for the 3,000, it would be a really nice pair of guns. And if you could get over some of the bits, it is lovely. Is there... Oh. Are they the nicest? What, are, what is the nicest room? Who knows? You'll have to watch till episode three where we go through our favorites for the entire show. <laughs>